Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Welcome back. It's September and it's starting to feel like hockey season out there. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And uh, Matt, quite an eventful off season, or at least a lot of things happening. Yeah, and with the leaves changing, it's time to change this, you know, everything onto a new page and a new it's team. It's not 35 degrees anymore. The leaves are changing. It's starting to feel like hockey season, isn't it? Yep. And we have finally a lot of things to talk about. So this show is going to be our recap of the summer. I know there's a lot of Flames fans that didn't pay attention to the team or didn't follow the team as closely as they might have wanted or as we did during the summer. So this is kind of, you know, when you watch your favorite TV show and they always remind you at the beginning what happened last season, that's what this episode is for all of our listeners. So we're going to remind you everything that happened over the summer so we can position you for uh, the start of the uh of the rookie tournament and then preseason starting over the next couple of weeks. So Matt, I think the best place to start is probably the entry draft. What do you think? Yeah. Well, that was pretty much the kickoff of the summer and the flames had a really good draft this year. Uh, the flames. Well, let's just go through the first couple players here. I'll go through some information and then I know you're, you've scouted these guys. So why don't you give us some thoughts on them? The flames first round pick number 16 overall, they used to take, Samuel Honzig, a centerman from the Vancouver Giants. He's an 18-year-old left shot, six foot four, 194 pounds from Slovakia. Yeah, he's a very adaptable player. Uh, he played a lot on the left side uh, during last season, and he's going to be used primarily as a center this year. Yeah, his coach came out and said they want him at center. Uh, he's a dynamic player. Uh, quick thinking forward offensively and has a good shot and quick release quick hands and he's six foot four so when you have that package frankly if he hadn't been injured during the season and missing a whole bunch of games he probably would have been a top 10 if not top five pick but you know with the last year's draft being so stacked that uh he kind of fell into the flames lap and you know like this year's draft uh, even though the Flames picked at 15, uh, the t- caliber of player in a normal year would have been like a fifth or sixth overall pick. So it, it, the Flames got lucky with a good player. And when we did our draft preview, the guys we wanted them to pick in that uh, spot were Oliver Moore, Nate Danielson, Gabe Perot, Brandon Yeager, and Otto Steenberg. Some of those guys were still available at that uh, spot. But the Flames ended up with this pick. And I agree with you. I think that this is a good pick. And with some injury trouble, maybe fans didn't get to see him as much as they wanted to with uh, the Giants. But I'm excited to see where he goes. My only concern here is we have a lot of these kind of European forwards who don't play physical hockey. And I'm wondering if he's going to project to be the same. Well, it depends on... Uh, how he utilizes his own body you know like he can be a non-physical player but if he uses his just physical attributes like he's six foot four 220 like that he you know he's gonna be hard to push off the puck just because of his size and if he can learn how to be like yager and you know use his rear end to create space for himself you know it with his quick hands and adaptable offensive skill you can have a player who's not necessarily going to go and crash and bang as a forward if he can provide that level of offense and he has all the tools to be an elite scorer in the nhl so it it's not how would you say it's not ideal because like obviously you'd like the physical element to be there as well but if he had that physical element as well he probably would have been second overall <laughs> that's a good point yeah and nice to see the flames taking a plus six footer that's not keegan kanzig yeah exactly and um, the, the flames that was their mantra of this draft of drafting giants who actually had skill <laughs> that's that's true and the next guy not as big but the 48th overall pick the calgary flames used to select etan morin a defenseman out of the moncton wildcats of the qmjhl six feet 183 pounds from quebec he's a left-handed defenseman what do you like about this guy etienne moran gotta have a little bit of french in there you know um he fits right in with huberdeau and peltier um having a bit of a french connection on the team he is a very solid defenseman. Uh, frankly, at the development camp, I thought he was the best defensive prospect 
that we've had at a development camp, and that includes you and guys I were there like watching Rasmus that Anderson scrimmage, and, and he's Shillington. really the only guy that showed showed up. Yeah, and he was willing to throw the body around, and his offensive game is, you know, excellent. Um, frankly, if this had been a normal year, he probably would have been like a fifteenth to twentieth overall pick. Uh, thankfully this draft happened to be absurdly deep and he fell to 48 where the flames were able to pick him up i think he had like 78 points or some such last year which for a defenseman is excellent uh his offensive game is very much like jeremy poirier's uh just a very good dynamic offensive defenseman but he also has that physical nasty edge put it this way if i was to guarantee a second round pick making the nhl Moran would be one of the top contenders for that type of distinction. Moran played 67 games with the Wildcats. He had 21 goals, 51 assists for 72 regular oh. season points, and then had 17 playoff points. And this is a guy who's played in the dub for two years, been in the playoffs both years. I think right now with where the Flames are in their development, we need to be bringing in guys that have playoff experience. Oh, for sure. And the more the merrier on that front. I've been watching some... I got some footage from a friend of mine who lives in Quebec of Morin. I had some notes here. I think he's got some really interesting, unique ways of breaking out. Like, he's he's one of the more interesting guys in that league when it comes to breakouts from his own end. And also, drawing pressure... Uh, on himself, but being able to pass through that pressure. How often have we seen defensemen draw pressure and then either choke the puck up or just do some dumb with it? Yeah, like, uh, oh, pass it to the other forward or... <laughs> or try to bank it off the boards and do something crazy that doesn't work and Easily somebody goes offside then, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. so it's good. And I think that uh, with Kale McCarr being in the league and... Uh, you know, young defenseman coming up, seeing exactly how McCarr does things to create space for himself, that you're starting to see that influence come a little bit more where he can separate and uh, do all the little shifty things that he does. And, that, you know, like uh, one of the guys that uh, Axelson uh, from the Axel uh, Hertig. Yeah. Um, he, the one, the guy that I was uh, raving about on the draft show, he uh, was uh, very much that same type of shifty defenseman. So you know, and Moran uh, fits that profile as well. And I think it's, it's a good pick. Yeah. And the third pick the Flames made at number eighty in the third round was a Russian player, Adar Suniev. I'm, I assume I'm saying that right. I've looked at some pronunciation guides. He played last year in the BCHL for the Penticton V's and is committed to UMass of the NCAA this year. He's an 18-year-old, six foot two, 192 pounder from Russia. Um, this guy, I'm having a hard time getting a read on. What do you know about him? Well, uh, the Flames were actually trying to trade it to get another second round pick to specifically select him and had like four different trades fall through apparently uh, because they really wanted this guy and then they're like, oh well, that all fell through so well, we'll just go with whomever's available at the third round and he just fell to them so it was like, hey, awesome. Uh, <laughs> he has a very weird skating stride and he's not slow but he's not quick either. But uh, the mechanics of how he skates is very bizarre. Um, and that's been the big knock on him is that his everything he does, like it, it needs to be like remade entirely in order for him to take the next steps. But between his size and his skill, like if he had the mechanics of the skating down correctly, he probably would have been a first rounder himself. And the Flames have invested in skating coaches the last couple of years, so I feel like that's something that they are probably equipped internally to work on. Yeah. Like, I remember reading about uh, him specifically, and uh, one person said that the only other guy who had that weird skating stride was Patrick Marlowe before he was drafted, and then his mechanics were altered, and he became one of the faster players in the NHL. So maybe we need to hire Marlowe to work with this guy. Yeah. Oh, hey, he's not doing anything, so... That's right. And, I mean, 90 points in 50 games for the BCHL, I always find that a hard lead to judge against just because of where it is and sort of the hierarchy. But 
I think we'll see what he does with UMass. And I, I think going to the NCAA for this player, not only does it give the Flames a little more eligibility time with him, which I think they want, it gives them four years uh, to sign him instead of two. And I think it's it'll probably be good for him to move from the BCHL to the NCAA to see what he's got. Yeah, and with it being a more professional league, and there's less games overall, so he can work on things like his skating stride when he's not having to prep for games and, you know, do all the other little homework things that he needs to do. And where instead of like, oh, you're playing every other night kind of thing. So I think overall, it's a very good fit for him and the team. And, you know, the, he's not a player that the Flames are needing to rush in any way, shape, or form. And, you know, him taking the full four years, you know, if he can come out of that being basically ready for the NHL, that would be perfect. And just to, I guess, finish off the draft preview, we won't go as deep into these guys, but the rest of the Flames picks. And the fourth round at 112, they took Jaden Lipinski from the Vancouver Giants, a centerman who's a right-handed shot, 6'4", 209, from Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, I really like this pick. Again, another big kid. He got 51 points, 6'6", games next year. This is a guy that, you know, at a fourth round is always a bit of a project, but I like the pick here. Yeah, enough skill in overall game where, like, if he makes the NHL, it'll probably be as, like, a good two-way center, but, you know, uh, you and need those not, two. And if not, I think Wranglers fans will enjoy watching this kid play for a couple of years. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in the sixth round, I mean, by the sixth round, everybody's kind of the same, so take the guy with the best hockey name, and that's what the Flames did. We got Igor Igorov. Uh, yeah. goaltender out of the MH MKH uh, Dynamo Moscow, which is essentially like the AHL to the KHL, if that makes sense. They're the minor league for the KHL. He's from Moscow, six foot three, hundred and eighty three pounds. Well, uh, you know, if you're left catcher. Yeah, if you you've got a goalie, you know, Pete Peters, you know, set the template. So you know, if you got a goalie with the same first and last name. You gotta go for it, cause watch know. Igor Igorov probably translates to Pete Peters. That's why we took him. <laughs> um, you know, and he's, you've he's said the same it, guy, right? <laughs> just it's like in the old movies when they put on a mustache and nobody notices them. Yeah, just change your name and say you're a different guy. Yeah. Um, you've said every year take a goaltender, right? And I think with Dustin Wolf right now, we're not looking for you know the next top starter for this team. But I think it, it's good to just have another goalie in the system. Oh, for sure. And, like, literally until you get the next Kiprasov, period, or Jonathan Quick or Carey Price or Andre Vasilevsky, unless you get, like, that caliber guy, just keep adding. and Because, you know, like, what happens if, say, Igorov turns out and Wolf turns out? Well, then you have two really awesome goalies that you can take the best of and trade the other one for a boatload of something. So, yep. you know, it it works out in the end. It's just, you know, until you get that elite, elite guy, you might as well just keep rolling the dice until you either find money or, you know, you just keep <laughs> going. And I like, I know a lot of people are hesitant about Russian players playing in Russia. I like that he's going to be playing in Russia. I think that, you know, it's a bit better league than a lot of the uh, Canadian uh, leagues that are out there. And... I think that uh, I, I think it could be good for him. Yeah, it's to, one of those to play where, with men and play in more of a structured professional league. Yeah, it's one of those where like there's no urgency to have him come and play like in the AHL or anything like that. The Flames are fairly well stocked with guys in the AHL, and you know, like you have Arsenis and I have in uh, the NCAA. You have uh, Chechilev in the minors. You have Wolf in the minors. Like, we're good. Uh, you know, let other guys develop yeah. elsewhere. And, and he when just those turned guys... 18 on August 30th. Like, this is still a very young goaltender. Yeah, it's one of those where, you know, like, when these guys graduate, Wolf and Chechilev and that, then you bring Sanayev and, you know, like, all the rest of the guys out and, you know, keep going, <laughs> basically, and... Yeah, and, you know, we need somebody to go play in Rapid City as well. Exactly. And the last pick the Flames made at 207, they took another defenseman from Rogel BK. I always like saying that name. Um, he's a Swedish player playing in the Swedish J, uh, Junior 20 League or Under 20 League. Left-handed shot, 18-year-old, six foot four, 
206 pounds, Axel Hertig. Yeah. And uh, not a lot to say with the seventh pick, but I think right now, good to see the Flames picking up some defensemen. Yeah. Well, and uh, the Flames just organizationally will continue to need some defensemen. Uh, they have a bit of time with uh, guys like Anderson and Chillington on the team and uh, Poirier and Moran, but you know, you'll know you need more guys as we move forward. And then the other big news coming out of the draft was that the Calgary Flames made a trade, and we didn't talk about this. We haven't talked since the draft, but uh, a lot of names were bandied about this summer as potentially leaving, and we'll talk about some of those a bit later. Tyler Toffoli traded by the Calgary Flames, the New Jersey Devils, uh, for Igor Sarangovich and a third-round pick in the 2023 NHL draft. All your um, Igors belong to us. <laughs> that's right. If your name's Igor, come play here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it, I'll be ha- honest. it has to start with a Y, though. It can't start with an I. It it has to be a Y first. <laughs> we we can we can we can make changes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll be honest. I did not know that there was a man named Igor Serengovich in the National Hockey League until this trade was made. But when you look at his stats last year in 75 games, he got 30 points. Uh, The year before that, 76 games, 46 points. I think that this is a guy that we don't know about simply because we've seen New Jersey twice. And Uh, we we don't have a big book on. But as I've gotten more into this trade... I like the pick and I like the, the pick of who to not really the draft pick, but the pick of kind of who they wanted to bring in for Toffoli. Yeah. Getting that third round pick and the player that we drafted certainly was a home run for that draft pick because we got a very good high skill forward prospect. But the way I look at it is Toffoli had such an amazing year last year that that was an it, abnormal year. Yeah. Like that, he is basically the poster child of unsustainable performance. <laughs> like he, you know, you don't have career years after the age of 30 and then repeat it. Like it, it's, you know, like, it, and there was a lot of times where he would score on shots that you're, you were at times, frankly, surprised that the puck went in. And, you know, like if he's only scored 20 goals next year, I wouldn't be shocked instead of like 33 or whatever he had. And it's one of those where he's going to regress. And Sharon Govich, he just got buried on New Jersey's team because they lucked out with drafting all of the centers, basically. Yeah. And, you know, they've hit home runs with all their draft picks, and he got forced down to the fourth line. And he didn't even play during the postseason, even though, you know, just because, you know, there wasn't enough room for it. And, it, you know, and it made perfect sense for them to move a depth center that they weren't really going to be utilizing for a winger that they needed. And for us, you know, like at the time we were kind of in limbo. Is Backlund going? Is Lindholm going? You know, is Dubé going to be our number one center? That kind of thing. So, you know, it, it got to that point where, you know, like getting somebody who can play center uh, was extremely necessary. Things settled down on the whole everybody wanting out part, especially I think because of how management has changed and you know coaching staff, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you know, having another high quality player who can play all three positions and has a decent two way game and he's very quick, where Tafoli was kind of average. Sharon Govich is game primarily is speed first which um there's a certain player who plays on left wing who struggled but uh last year but uh who excels with very fast guys and finding them on their way to the net so i think that might be a good match up this season you know, and you brought up an important point. I mean, yes, last year Toffoli got 73 points. That's abnormal. His best season, I'm just doing some math here, was before that was 58 points in 2015-16. He was a very younger man then. Like my back of the napkin math says he's averaging about 39 to 40 points a year. So, you know, the, last year's an anomaly. Last year's not probably the, you know, the norm for this guy. So, I think the Flames sold high on him, and I think Sharon Govich will replace those numbers very well. Yeah, like, would I be surprised if uh, Sharon Govich outperformed Toffoli next year? No. 
it, it could very well work out that way. And at worst, I think that Sharon Govich basically is at the same age that Foley was when, you know, like earlier in his career. Foley, I think they'll for those be that basically don't know, is 31 right now and Sharon Govich is 25. I think that like what you're going to get is like age 25 production from Toffoli out of Sharon Govich. So, you know, like a 50 point caliber guy and, you know, a good middle six forward. And he might spike if he finds, you know, a certain dynamism with Uberto could happen. And yeah, I think right now, you know, Lindholm and, and that's part of the uncertainty, too. I think the Flames weren't quite sure if Lindholm would be here. If not, I think, you know, that gives you a nice guy to put in those top two forwards. Uh, Lindholm, if we look at Lindholm, Kadri, Backlund is the top three right now. I would not be surprised to see Sharon Govich get a shot at first line right. Yeah, same here. Because he can't play all they, three spots. So, it, yeah, it, it, he's as flexible as you can get. So. And, and I think, you know, in the need for centerman, we know he can play there. Uh, the Flames immediately signed Sharon Govich to a two-year deal at $3.1 million a year, so saving some money over to Foley. And, I mean, if we can get, you know, even 35 points out of this guy, 3.1 is going to look like a steal. Yeah. And if he breaks out, then, hey, even better. And, you know, like, a, a, you know, if at the end of his contract he requires a number starting with a six or a seven, it's like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, even if he puts up, you know, I know I've been critical of Dubé over the years, but even if he puts up kind of Dubé numbers, you know, I think three million is not going to be bad. If he's a good second line guy when it all shakes out, three millions. I mean, we're paying Blake Coleman close to five. Like, you know, we're paying Backlund close to six. Like, you've got to find value. And I think they are going to find some value with this guy. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. I, I'm one of the few people who like the trade off off the start, um, pretty much, just because eh, anytime you have a guy that's an impending free agent and he's on a career year, it, it, you know, it's not likely that that guy's going to match. So, you know, might as well maximize the asset instead of, you know. <laughs> And I think some Flames fans were upset the Flames didn't get more out of out of Toffoli. But again, this guy had one really good year. He's not a 70-point career guy. No. He's a 30-point career guy. And if you look at a 30 to 35-point career guy, could the Flames have maybe got a little bit more? Sure. But I, I think in the end, we're going to look back at this and say, you know what? The Flames got a good, an, a fair return. Yeah. Nobody got fleeced here. I don't think Toffoli stays in New Jersey more than this one year. I can't see him re-signing there. But I think that this will be some of the Flames will look at and go, we kept Sharon Govich, and he became more of an impact for us than Toffoli was for the Devils. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's one of those where it also makes the team a little bit younger, which the team has been basically their mantra since the GM change of you know instilling youth in the organization and all that kind of stuff. And Sharon Govich will be wearing the number of the departing Milan Lucic. It's been announced he'll be wearing number 17 this year for the Calgary Flames. Matt, I guess the next part's more procedural than anything. We don't need to talk about a lot of these, but the Flames made a whole bunch of re-signings, mostly with uh, with Wranglers players. But let's just go through this this list quickly. Walker Dewar re-signed a two-year deal. Uh, that's one name we might see at the NHL level. Um, yeah, I, I pretty much guarantee and pencil him in as the fourth-line winger for this year. I agree. Oscar Dansk, one year, two way Clark Bishop, two years, 775 K Martin Pospisil, one year Dryden hunt who the flames acquired at the trade deadline. One year, uh, 775,000 Colton Pullman, one year, 775,000 Ben Jones, one year, two way. I couldn't get numbers on that. Um, and then Emilio P- Pedersen, one year, two way. So really here, a cast of characters that have been around for a little while, all these guys, except for Hunt. Hunt makes sense. He's a Calgary guy. He has a place in Calgary. I believe it was actually Mackenzie Weger was staying at Hunt's place in Calgary until Hunt got traded to Calgary and he had his own place back. And at that point, you could probably say, Mackenzie, you just got a big deal. Go buy a place. Um but, you know, I, I don't think – I think all these guys are guys that we expected to come back. Yeah, and the only real departure from the Flames Farm team was Matthew Phillips. 
let's let's get there. So the four guys that are leaving here: Milan Lucic back to Boston, Troy Stetcher back to Arizona, Matthew Phillips, like you said, to Washington, and Trevor Lewis to LA. So let's start with Phillips. This is a guy that I think. I mean, he's a Calgary player. I still believe that the only reason he came back to the Flames last year was the prospect of playing for the Wranglers in front of his his Calgary friends and family in his hometown and maybe getting an NHL bump. Not getting an NHL bump? I don't blame him for leaving. No. Uh, the writing was on the wall. Would I have been entirely surprised if he came back? No. But like it would have been like a, one of those where, oh, you're expecting to be in the NHL at the start of the year level. Like That's the reason why you're, you know... It's your job to lose, type of thing. And, and yeah, I don't and I think, think the, the Flames... big fact that his coach, um, Mitch Love, went over there probably had a big reason for that too. Yeah, I agree. And you know, it's disappointing because you you know you don't like to see a prolific AHL scorer depart your team, just you know, especially a homegrown draft pick and all that. But you look at other guys like Austin Zarnick. He was basically the same guy as uh, Phillips with Boston and he never really found a niche and even though he was a very good AHL scorer he came here and was just okay and then was never heard from again and you know Phillips like if he sticks in the NHL that'll be great for him but like even with us like it would have been a very uphill climb for Phillips to stay in the NHL You know, I think Washington, with where they are with their team, he's going to play, I'd say, the majority of their games. And I think this really lets us see, is this guy an NHL player or not? And he's only on a one-year deal in Washington. Nothing's to say if he proves he's an NHL player, we don't see him back in a Flames jersey for 2024-2025. Yeah, it just, everything depends. And I don't, uh, for me, I, I am skeptical of him, you know, maintaining an nhl spot all season but we'll see and you know all the power to him i I just think that washington is short short young forwards right now yeah i agree on that front and i think that they're they're in a little bit of a downward trajectory so i think he'll probably make that team yeah they're basically like where chicago was like two years ago like kind of in that quasi we're rebuilding but we're not until like ovechkin goes and then they're they're just going to be scorched earth I like Matthew as a guy. He's a nice guy, and oh, yeah. I, you know I wish him nothing but success. So, oh, I agree. hopefully, he, hopefully, he can go to Washington. And we can get a better sense of what he is. Is he an NHL player? Is he, as some people call him, quad A players? That guy who's too good for the uh, too good for the AHL, not really good enough for the NHL. Is he, you know, a European superstar? What do we have with this guy? And I think this year is really going to tell us. Yeah, and he was always one of the nicest interviews we had at, at development camps and this the like. And, you know, you always want to root for the local kid and all the best to him. And hopefully he has a good season with Washington and go from there. You know, uh, it just it's always disappointing when it doesn't work out with your team. But, you know, that's life at times. And, you know, one one guy that left that surprises me is Troy Stetcher. The Flames brought him in at the trade deadline. I thought he looked really good on our blue line. Uh, famously, he had a tweet, and he was becoming a Calgarian, talking about dog poop on his lawn. And everyone's like, yeah, this guy's uh, becoming a true Calgarian here. Goes back to Arizona for $1.1 million. Like, I have to assume the Flames would have offered him at least that much, and I can't see why you'd pick Arizona over Calgary. Um, yeah, I think uh, he liked Daryl. And once Daryl got fired, because he was praising Daryl uh, down the stretch, and then like once Daryl got fired, you know, like was I surprised that he left? No. Um, it, I'm not it's surprised one of those... he left either. I'm surprised, I guess, more that he went back to Arizona. True. Um, it's one of those where, frankly, at this point in time, the Flames don't really need him. Um, with Shillington coming back and. You know, the Flames not losing anybody from the blue line other than Michael Please. Stone, who's... That's exactly the role I thought he might take, is that number seven role. Yeah, and it makes more sense for him specifically to go to Arizona where he's guaranteed to play instead of, you know, being the, the number seven guy here. And Yeah, that's true. You know, and realistically, like, he would not be playing over 
a guy like Tanev or Zadorov. So, you know, it, it just, there's no sense. That's true, yeah. Well, enjoy your uh, 5,000 fans in Mullet Arena. Yep, exactly. And, you know, hopefully he has a, you know, because he was really good for us down the stretch. Hopefully he carries on with that level of play and earns himself a pay raise after next season. Um, He's 29. I think his his payday years are behind him. I agree. Um, It's one of those where uh, the Flames, though, like at this point, uh, with the six guys that they have on their team, you're looking at Poirier basically being ready for the NHL. You have uh, Gilbert, who is the number seven the facto yeah. guy and i could see them going out and, and you know claiming a guy of waivers the day before the season starts too if they want yeah like if those guys are just not ready through training camp there's always like 15 guys that are that quasi number seven guy that are always available it's just pick which name on the list and you're good yeah <laughs> well and uh we may see a flames blue line pairing this year in uh arizona it's expected the troy stetcher's partner will be Yusuf valamaki yep Anything to say about Lucic to Boston or Lewis to LA? It seems like everybody that left the flames kind of went back to their old team. It's like they're running back to where they came from. Yeah. Well, Lucic in Boston, like I think that like if the dollars would have worked, I think that would have happened at the trade deadline. Uh, I think you're right. Yeah. But uh, that was like clearly telegraphed of, yeah, he's going to go to Boston and sure enough. And they've been getting the old band back together for a couple of years now. So it, it makes entire sense. And, you know, I, I expect this to be his final year in the NHL. And I also expected Lewis would have retired after the season. He's 36 right now. I'm kind of surprised well, he signed a, a deal in LA. He's serviceable. Like he didn't, he was the, probably the best of the fourth liners we had last year. So what he signed for? Oh, he signed for league minimum. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Like, it, you know, he's still a, an NHL player. He might be the 13th guy more so now than the 12th guy, but you know, he definitely can fill in on a pinch and uh flames. Uh, I guess former flame now, Nick Ritchie, who they brought in the deadline, still an unrestricted free agent. So hopefully he'll find probably a, a professional tryout somewhere. I'm sure I, Brett Ritchie will be a tryout too. And do you, do you hear that? I hear Austria calling. Pretty much, yeah. Like it, it's one of your kind of B level. I, I think both those guys have had their NHL shots at this point. We know what they've got. I think you're either taking an AHL deal or a European deal. Yeah, and it just depends on your preference. And and for the first time ever, we won't get a, really into this today, but we have an independent AHL team this year. Chicago Wolves have no affiliation, so I mean, there might be some jobs there. Yep, and it's one of those where. Like there's like every team's gonna need veterans on tryouts just because of league mandates. So like I'm sure that they will try out somewhere. Um, oh, I, I have no doubt they'll try out. I just, I you know whether they make stick and make the team or not, you know it's up to them. But they'll probably end up being AHL fodder or yeah. the thirteenth forward. I don't yeah, see and, either of them getting like a full time gig again. No, and like I was saying, with an independent AHL team for the first time, they're going to need to be competitive. So I can see them bringing in some vets like those guys. Yep. Um, let's talk about the two guys the Flames brought in. As always, as NHL fans, we wait on July 1st, or not July 1st this year, but free agent day. We wait and we wait and we wait to see who our team brings in. And the Flames go out and get Jordan Osterley, a left shot defenseman, 31 years old from. Dearborn Heights, Michigan. Uh, fans will probably know him for the last couple of years with the Detroit Red Wings. And then they go out and get Brady Lyle, a right shot defenseman, 24 years old from North Bay, Ontario, who's played the last four years in the AHL. I think that with Stetcher not coming back, Osterley fills that spot well. Yep. Yeah. He's the Michael Stone replacement. Yep. And yeah. 30, 31 years old. He's going to wear number 82 for the Flames. Um, you know, he played for the Oilers, the Blackhawks, the Coyotes, the Red Wings. He's not a guy who puts up a ton of points, but I think he's very similar to Michael Stone. He's a serviceable NHLer when you need him. Yeah. He knows what end of the stick is up and how to play, and you're not expecting anything more than, hey, I can eat 10 minutes. And, yeah, that's about it. Uh, well, and I think not only eat 10 minutes, but I, I think he's a guy who we can probably rely on to be ready when we need him. I mean, that was always the thing you and I really liked about Stone is no matter 
how many games he hadn't played for, he always seemed ready, right? Yeah. And I could see Osterley being in that spot as well. Yep. I'd be surprised. I mean, Osterley played 52 games last year for a not great Detroit Red Wings team. I'd be surprised if he sees 30 with the Flames. Yeah. It basically, is it is Tanev healthy? <laughs> and then, you know. That's right. And if, how injured is Tanev? Yeah. And... <laughs> if, if, if unhealthy, Osterley plays. Break glass, play Osterley. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then Brady Lyle, who was brought in from the Blues organization, played the last two years in Springfield. Again, I don't see this guy making the NHL on the opening day roster. I think, and we saw the Flames bring up a number of guys from the from the AHL over the past couple of years. Yeah, like that... DeSimone, Gilbert. Like, yeah, you know, exactly. And uh, another of that ilk where... Uh, a number eight, number nine defenseman, which... I think Brady Lyle starts in the Wranglers roster, and I think, you know, they're looking for maybe some more veteran uh, defenders down there. Yeah. So I think if we look at it that way, this is a good pickup. If Tanev's out and somebody else gets hurt. <laughs> if Tanev out and Osterley out yeah. and De Simone out, yeah. then bring in Lyle. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and and Peltier out, or not Peltier, out. Um, Poirier yeah. and Poirier out. Lyle, you're up. Yep. <laughs> and after that, Blasty, you're up. Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, I mean, both of these depth s- signings, but I guess, Matt, realistically, as a Flames fan, did you see the Flames making a splash on, on free agent day? Well, no. And uh, how would you say the, the last couple of years, like the Flames have been shoehorning vets in just because, hey, let's shoehorn vets in. And not really giving any young players any real chance. And like, Craig Conroy said we're not doing that this year. And it's been frustrating, you know, because, like, frankly, Pelte and Phillips should have started the team with the team at the start of last season and got a good chance for a couple months to figure out if they were ready full time in the NHL and, you know, managed much like Mangiapane was. But you look at the roster at the start of last year, there was no room, there was no chance, and like even if they blew the doors off in training camp, there was no room and no chance. And it's like, now it's, especially with Walker Dewar's performance and Peltier's performance, you know, you have two guys that are basically ready for the NHL full time. You gotta give Coronado a look. Yeah, and Coronado, he did not look out of, he was honestly was one of the best players in his one game in the NHL. And it's like, you know, he looked NHL ready. And it's one of those where you need some runway for these guys. And, you know, having a fourth line, like, say if you had Peltier, Coronado, and Dewar together on the fourth line, like, it'll give them an opportunity to learn while having sheltered minutes. And, you know, they can shift up and down the lineup if they're having a good game and, you know, learn on the fly and all three of those players are very quick players as well which that's been one of the main problems with the flames forward group for years is that team speed has been a drawback like their talent level has always been a top tier caliber team it's just the speed has limited them in a lot of games and you know, it it's a good thing that this team is starting to realize that you need to be able to keep up with the other team as well as do all the other things as well. Right now, the Calgary Flames are $200,000 over the salary cap, which is allowed in the offseason. But like going into this day, I had no illusion the Flames were going to do much of anything. They, I think, you know, when we heard from them last year, they were fairly confident running back the roster they had. We saw the Defoley deal done. They had no money to do anything. As you mentioned, Craig Conroy said he wants to leave spots for young players. Like, if they were going to do something in free agency, they would have had to make a, a move first. They would have had to move out a contract to bring in another one. I just, I expected this team to be very quiet, and they were. Yeah, and you even see, like, the guys who were kind of quasi-wanting out at the beginning of uh, free agency and the, at the draft, like, uh... Lindholm and Backlund and Hannafin, you know, like the the six impending free agents basically all at one point said that they wanted out because, like, you know, like everybody kind of got panicked at that point. And it's like, are you going to tear the team down? Because who wants to be there for a team that's entering a rebuild? But, um, 
you know, with there being a re-emphasis with certain coaching hires and uh, from management that, you know, like this team is going to be competitive, you're starting to see all of those guys walking back those comments and saying, well, basically, as long as the team's good, I'm interested in... And we've already seen some of that. Michael Backlund and Noah Hannafin this week, both already coming out. Michael Hannafin said this summer he'll make a decision he wants to, or sorry, he said this summer that he wants to see how the season goes before re-signing. He's an older player. He wants to be successful. And if the Flames aren't doing what he wants, he'll want to move. And it sounds like Hannafin the same. Yeah, which, you know, frankly, at, like say the Flames are out of a playoff spot at the trade deadline you're going to move anybody who's not already signed by that point. Like it, yep. you, you've got burned by Kachuk and Gaudreau. But know, even, it, if they're, even if they're not out of it, I mean, this team's been a perpetual middling team. I think if they don't go past round two, a lot of these guys are going to say, got to look elsewhere. Yeah. And the weird thing is, is that, you know, the flames did miss the playoffs by three points last year, but like every single thing that could have went wrong other than injuries basically went wrong last year. And just for, like, as much as, like, Toffoli overperformed last year, so many guys underperformed. Yeah. Uh, like, Manjapane, how many posts did he hit? You know, like, e even if half of those go in, like, he'll be a 25-30 goal scorer again. And, <laughs> you know, and it's one of those where, like, Huberto's not a 58-point player. That's going to go back up to 90. Like, because just the offensive style is going to be different this year and and i think backland's gonna be like jerome mcginla and i don't think it's flames fans we can fault him if at 34 going into his 35 year old season next year he wants to chase a cup elsewhere like if the flames can't get him that i think as flames fans we owe him that to not hold against him if he wants to go elsewhere oh no and i'm be more than happy if he he's won a stayed cup. here long enough and if the flames can't do it he's got to go elsewhere yeah and i don't blame him you know like you know he'd He's an excellent player, and he deserves to have his name on the cup if he can. And, you know, much like a lot of higher quality two-way players, like, you know, he should be able to. It's just, for whatever reason, it's not a working situation here at up till now. We'll see how this season goes, as even he's waiting and seeing. But... You know, it, like this team has all the ability to bounce back and be an elite team again this year. It's just, you know, does the pendulum swing back the other way? Like it swing back, you know, to like everything being a disaster last year. You know, like if Markstrom plays like Markstrom normally does, like that, that's like a 15 point swing. Well, let's come back more. to that next episode when we yeah. look ahead to the season. But I think talking about some of this idea of these guys wanting out, and I think, you know, there was a lot of smoke there at the beginning of the summer and that sort of thing. I don't know what you think, Matt, but I think the fact that, you know, free agency opened and we saw nobody moved, I think the fact that it's now September 13th as we record this and we see nobody being moved, I think it's more smoke than fire. Like, I think if there was a guy that really said, I have no plans to come back, he'd be gone by now. Yeah, and realistically... You look around at the league, and like the cap's not going to go up this year after the season. Like it, it, you know, the whole network situation in the states and still recovering from COVID. Like the cap's not going anywhere. Most teams are right at the cap anyway, so like your options are basically teams like Arizona, Anaheim, Buffalo, San Jose. You would have had free, to make a hockey deal. Yeah, you know, and for uh, teams that would sign them as free agents, like there's just no teams really that have, a, like even Tarasenko, who should have got more than $5 million, only managed a one-year $5 million deal with Ottawa. Like he should have got seven or eight, but there's just no dollars available. And so I'm sure a lot of the players are also realizing that after – you know, I'm sure that the management was being up front, like, hey, these are the offers, and, you know, like, there's not a lot to choose from if you're wanting to re-sign long-term, and, you know, like, there's not a lot of dollars at the moment, and, you know, you, you have the potential of being a good team here. A lot of those other teams, though, like, if you're going to, like, a San Jose or an Ana Anaheim or Arizona, 
Like, they're deadbeats for a while. <laughs> like, you're going to be bad for the first three or four years of that contract. And I think, you know, you mentioned it there, you know, nobody really has the money now. But I think I think these players also, and you kind of touched on this, believe this could be the year. Like, I think everyone knows it, it's a good team on paper. And we'll talk more about what the team is next next week or next episode but I think I think all these guys are in the wait and see approach now, and now it's up to the Flames to show them that we can do this, and the new coach can do this, and that sort of thing. So, you know, the fact nobody's moved, I think, says something about the faith that these players have in this roster as well. Yeah, because realistically, like if the Flames, like they were really unlucky last year. Like the goaltending performances on both the goalies was absolutely dreadful. You know, the horrendous luck in overtime where they only had a handful of wins where, you know, if they were even 500, they were would have been like the third seed in our division instead of just the wild card team. You know, it, it just like everything that could have went wrong and sideways did last year. So, you know, like this team is closer to the Gaudreau Kachuk final year team than it was last year's iteration. It's just... You know, seeing and like with Wolf being a little bit older, like if the two goalies falter, you'd you'd easily see Wolf draw in at you know if the both of the guys were struggling again this year and 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 like there's actual options available to this team. Let's talk about coaches, shall we? Yep. Um, we know the Flames got a new head coach, Ryan Huska, coming as head coach, and a whole bunch of assistant coaches and players changed around here as well. So, uh, a name I never thought I'd see associated with the Flames again, Mark Savard, who started his well, didn't start his career with the Flames, started with the with the Rangers, but probably most known for his time with the Flames. Um, he has been an assistant coach with the St. Louis Blues. In the last couple of years, he was the head coach of the OHL Windsor Spitfires. Joining Huska's staff as an assistant coach, he'll be coaching the forwards in power play. And then Dan Lambert coming to the Flames from Nashville. He was an assistant coach there. He uh, worked previously with Huska when they were both with the Kelowna Rockets uh, coming into the Flames as well. That puts Kale McLean off the bench. He's in the eye in the sky position that Marty Jelena was previously in. Jelena now moves to player development. And Matt, the guy we can't get rid of, Michael Stone is back. He's retired, but he's back as the development coach already. And he pretty much retired. And they had him back on the ice, I think, the same day at uh, yeah. the rookie dev camp working with players. Yep. Well, just because you're retired doesn't mean that you don't get your ass out there and skate. <laughs> That's right. I mean, you and I have talked about how, you know, this guy will be around as long as he wants to be around. And, you know, we even though he's retired, the Flames still can't get rid of him. No. <laughs> um, any thoughts on these coaching moves? Well, when the Flames announced they hired Mark Savard, I'm like, and there's Huberdeau fixed. Because, you know... It, Mark Savard was basically the same type of player that Huberdeau is as a player. A very good passer and knows how offensive games work um, and how best to generate offense. Uh, so him being in charge of the forwards and the power play, uh, this is completely tailored to, hey, Jonathan, uh, time to earn your $10 million. Let's have fun. <laughs> yep. And, you know, an interesting thing about both Savard and Lambert, um, in their time as head coaches, more wins than losses. And I know that, you know, fans probably don't care about that, but I think that shows something about these head coaches, that they knew how to get the best out of their teams. They knew how to get those wins. And I think and a team that wants to be a playoff team, it's important to have, like we talked about, you know, with the draft, bringing in guys who have playoff experience. Um, both his years in the OHL, uh, Lambert was, uh, that he was head coaching. He made it to the playoffs. And or sorry, all three of them. One year he won the championship with Kelowna, and same thing with Savard. He made the playoffs both years. So again, guys that kind of know the pressure that comes with the playoffs. Yeah, and then, you know this team needs to have a different mindset on how to generate offense from the hey we have the puck in the offensive zone shoot it <laughs> that Daryl employed last year, which was beyond stupid, and you know it was a tire fire um so you know it might have been the worst offensive system i've ever seen 
I so. was rewatching Jurassic Park this summer. I don't know if you remember the opening scene, but that Australian guy goes, shoot her, shoot her. I'm like, there, Daryl just played that for the boys and said, good luck, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the fact that uh, the Flames now actually have an offensive system that is an NHL offensive system, you'll see a better off dynamic on this team. Because uh, like the, the Flames have way too many creative players to have that much regression from like everybody last year um the, you just don't see a guy going from 115 points who's basically consistently been the 90 plus point player to 58 unless there's something drastically wrong so you know like it's not like huberto forgot how to play hockey it's you know so it it's one of those where like now that we have better personnel to match his style and a coaching staff that matches his style, you know, because he, you know he, the Flames will go as far as Huberdeau plays. Like, frankly, like he is the That's star fair. player on the team, and you know we need him to be a ninety-plus point player this year. The other thing I think the I guess maybe I'm reading the tea leaves on this, but how many head coaches of the Flames had that they just kind of inserted into a coaching staff? And I think it shows Huska's not just a one-year fill-in guy or one-year replacement. Huska's building his own staff. And I think when you give a head coach the ability to build your own staff, you're committing to that coach. I mean, Jeff Ward came in, pretty much ran with the assistants we had. Gullitson ran with the assistants we had. Even Daryl pretty much ran with the assistants they had or brought a guy up from the AHL. But I think the fact that, you know, the Flames are willing to pay money to Savard and Lambert, and I have to imagine, you know, might have had to pay Nashville something to get Lambert out of there. Um, I think that really shows that they think Huska is their guy for long term and want to build a staff around him and not just insert him into a staff. Yeah, and Huska's been an extremely good coach at every level, and he's been a successful defensive coach with this team. Um, you see guys like Anderson and Shillington, as they've developed, they, they've they become very good two-way players, and you know, you're seeing like the whole defense core was fairly good last season, and you're seeing Zadorov emerge, and you know, like he's really taken the next step, and it's one of those things where if he can adapt the offensive system with Savard's help to be a good NHL offense with the emphasis, because he knows how to generate a good defensive structure, that you know, this team will have some very good balance between having a good offense and a good defense. I guess my only concern here, and one of the things I like that they did in the head office, is they've got Craig Conroy sandwiched between two experienced NHL guys and Don Maloney and Dave Nonis. You know, two guys that have a lot of league experience. And when I look at this coaching staff, it's a lot of unknown guys, a lot of guys without a lot of NHL head coaching experience. And I kind of expected somewhere in there, they'd add a guy with at least a year or two of head coaching experience as an associate or, you know, something like that. So I guess one of my hesitations here is that maybe this coaching staff doesn't have enough NHL experience. Yeah. It, it's one of those where, um, the flames are, well, how would you say that? Over the last handful of coaches uh, from uh, Bill Peters forward, it's been kind of more the old school mindset. So having a new school coach and coaching staff, it, uh, especially with the team wanting a more youthful, invigorated lineup as well with the veteran players, I think that that will help to foster... You know, because, uh, like, uh, how would you say, uh, having the way that Daryl did things last year did not work out in any way, shape, or form. So. No, and I wouldn't expect a guy like that to be in a decision-making role like Daryl, but I think you could get a guy who's not 60, who's not one of the old guard, if you will. There's been a number of guys in the last couple of years who have either been really highly regarded assistants or have sort of had a cup of coffee as a head coach. And maybe it's bringing one of those guys in. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's sort of like your Dave Notis, right? I don't think anyone would look at Dave Notis as an old guard in the GM role, but a guy who's done it and can provide some feedback. Yeah. It's one of those that, like, I, I'm not objecting to them just going, like, new school with all of their guys. Um, how would you say? Because they went old guard with everybody lightly, that having, you know, a different approach to this 
particular coaching staff. Uh, how would you say if you're getting like the same message over and over and over again, just getting a different script entirely, uh, you know, and a different mindset entirely, I think is, is what this team needs to turn the page. And like, if this team, like after this season is finding that they're having certain issues, then you can adjust it then. But I think that just to break from, you know, the last handful of years entirely and just switch the page, I think this is Yeah, no, and I think I'd go either way. Like, I guess a guy I'm thinking of is a guy like a Jeff Blaschel, who's yeah. currently an assistant coach in Tampa, but has some head coaching experience with Detroit. Not that I'd put him instead of Huska, but making him Huska's top lieutenant, sort of like known as the top lieutenant for, you know, Conroy. And I could just see a guy like that, a younger guy who yeah, has come up in the modern NHL in that associate role. I agree. And then the last coach we should talk about is, uh, and I think honestly, I do oh. think that, uh, you know, if the flames have struggles this year, that you'll see that kind of a guy getting added next year, but, or even mid season. I mean, I could see a guy like that getting canned mid season and maybe being brought in. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, you're probably right. Let's see what they do. Let's give Huska the chance to build his staff the way he wants it with the guys he's familiar with. And if it doesn't work, then we can always add next year. Yeah. Um, so the last coach I want to talk about, Mitch Love, was constant talk for us on the last couple of shows. Would he become head coach? Would he not? If he's not head coach, would he become an assistant? Well, we know the answer to that now. He is now an assistant coach in Washington, and he's been replaced as the head coach of the Calgary Wranglers by Trent Cull. And if that name doesn't sound familiar, he didn't play much in the NHL. He didn't actually play at all in the NHL, but has a lot of coaching experience. He's been a, a coach since the 0405 season. He coached as assistant with Guelph at the OHL, Syracuse at the AHL. He was the head coach for three years of Sudbury of the OHL, then back to the AHL with Syracuse. And then since 2017, 2018, he's been the head coach of the Utica Comets, which was the... I think uh, New Jersey affiliate of the time last year, he was the head coach of the AHL or sorry, 21, 22 is the head coach of the Abbotsford Canucks. And then he was a head coach last or an assistant coach last year for the Canucks and now brought to Calgary. Um, and I, I think a guy here who's shown, he knows the development system. I mean, he spent, you know, a dozen years in the AHL, the OHL. I think this is a good hire. Yeah. Serviceable AHL coach. You know, and Love was not a, a decorated coach when we brought him in either. Yeah, I think that the main reason why the Flames passed on Mitch Love was the Dustin Wolf factor, um, because Wolf is an exceptional player. You know, he won the MVP. You know, gold top goalie each of the two years, and it's like how much of the Heat slash Wrangler success is due to the goaltender. And, you know, like, frankly, if you replace him with just a league average goaltender or even a above average AHL goaltender, like, uh, nobody's clamoring for Mitch Love to be in the NHL. No, I think Mitch Love looked better because of his goaltender. Yeah. And I don't think we can. I think he's a good coach, but I don't think we can, you know, say that the Wranglers are successful because of that coach. Yeah. Like, would I have been happy if he had stayed in the organization and had been one of the assistants? Sure. And I understand him not wanting to. Yeah. And, you know, he gets an opportunity in Washington, and good for him. Sort of like we were saying with Phillips, right? I mean, you know, go take the opportunity and see what you can do. Yeah. It, it makes entire sense, and, you know, uh, we'll see how Wolf does. And, you know, that's, you know, and it'll be interesting how the Flames handle Wolf this year because... I'm figuring that even though they have the two goalies that they might utilize Wolf at some point in the season because of how, uh, like the flames and the Wranglers both sharing the same building and the, the Wranglers only playing on weekends. It's easy to say, Hey, we're playing on a Tuesday. You know, you want to slot in for a game here and there. Yeah, we'll see. And we'll talk about that as we look ahead to the season as well. Oh yeah. The other thing I like about Cull is he's got AHL head coaching experience. I mean, he's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven seasons by my count of AHL head coaching experience. He has another, looks like about eight 
years of AHL uh, assistant coaching experience. So this is a guy who knows that league and knows what it takes to be successful in that league. And I think when you, you know, I think the Flames, and I don't want this to sound negative towards Mitch Love, but I think in some ways they got lucky with him. So like you were saying, it was really the goaltender, you know, some of the forwards. But, I, you know, he he had no AHL experience. And I think for you to stick around the AHL as long as Cole has, you know, he's had some head coaching opportunities. He's had some assistant coaching opportunities. I think it shows something about your ability to develop players. Yeah. And you don't keep getting hired if you're doing a bad job. And, you know, I, and I think that especially over the next couple of seasons, the Flames really need to make sure that their farm system is developing guys the right way and fostering them properly. So, because the Flames, like even though like they're still going for it, they're in the beginning of a rebuild, retool. Even if they keep most of their veteran guys, because they're gonna need to have, you know, the um, the Poriers and all of those guys starting to filter into the NHL and you know mm. the new crop coming up you know and like the flames can't just keep you know plugging holes with veterans anymore like they need to you know like say like a guy like tanev you're not likely going to see him stay after the season and you're gonna likely see a guy like poirier take his spot in the nhl next year and you know that kind of thing just because of cap management etc cetera, etc cetera. so like you need to have guys developing properly where you can lose a guy like Tanev and not have, you know, you have your team fall off the cliff. And I think one thing, and not a lot of people talk about this and maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I'm overvaluing this. You tell me, but one thing I liked about Mitch Love is he had six years of AHL experience as a player. I like that, uh, that call has between the AHL and the old IHL about 10 years of minor experience. Like I think, those are the kind of guys that can teach these players what it means to play that league. Even though none of them really got an NHL look, the HLs are hardly to play in. There's a lot of bus rides. There's a lot of that sort of thing. So I think, you know, having Cole have those 10 years, he played in the AHL and the IHL from 94 until 04. So like 10 seasons, I think that really shows that this guy knows what these players are going through. Yeah. And if anybody knows, <laughs> you know, the ups and the downs and the hurdles and, the challenges and the adversity that you need to go through to get to that next level, it would be a guy like Cole and or Mitch. Um, I'm going to give you a, maybe a far out prediction on this. I think Cole might be a one year option for the flames. I wouldn't be surprised if the goal next year is to bring Jerome McGinley as the Wranglers head coach. I would not be shocked. He's been doing development work in Kelowna. He's still got one year there with the group he's with in Kelowna. So they can't bring him in this year. But I think that the goal might be to bring him in to continue his development work as the uh, as the head coach of the Wranglers. Yep. So uh, you can already pencil in the Flames' first round draft pick as being Tig this year. Uh, maybe. I don't know if you, I don't know if you go that far. We'll see. <laughs> Daryl drafted his kid. I don't know if they want to do that again. Well. You know, hey, he is captaining the Wranglers, so... And for a seventh-round draft pick, he actually did play in the NHL, so that's a success. That's <laughs> so, so so overall, if you had to sum up the offseason in one sentence, how would you sum it up? Um, Whelming. <laughs> you know, like... It, it, Not it, overwhelming it, or underwhelming, just whelming. Yes. Okay. It, it, it you know... Not a, it existed. Yeah, and not not a lot of things changed because the Flames are kind of in this weird position where they should have been a lot better last year, and they made a lot of changes to make this year's team better. And it's one of those you're kind of betting on that, hey, everything screwed up last year, and that's not going to happen again. So, you know, you don't need to throw out the whole team just because you know you had one season where everything went wrong and like the fundamentals of this team is really strong still like the the flames defense core is one of the top three in the league still you know the flames forward group still is three lines deep the, the goaltending is still you know like as long as it bounces back to being nhl caliber like last year it was not really but, you know, Wolf is also NHL ready, so, like, if 
they falter, you have an option. You know, like, there, there is every reason why this team should be better. And you can't really make that call until you see them play. And until- I would say for me, well means not a word, so I'm going to go with, I guess, expected and needed. It's what I expected. It's what they needed. They didn't need to make a big splash. No. They didn't need to go out and make big changes. Um, it's kind of what I expected. Yeah. And... You know, Which, as a Flames fan, was disappointing. Like, I text you a number of times over the summer being like, Matt, something else has to happen, right? Like, we're, we're waiting for that other shoe to drop. And that's part of the reason we didn't do a show all summer is we were waiting for the other shoe to drop, and it never did. And so, but when I reflect on it as an analyst, it's it's what they need to do. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it, it's... It's frustrating because, like, everybody is like, oh, well, you just plug in this and you plug out that and, you know, you do this and you do that and, you you know, you fix it. But sometimes you don't really need to do anything other than what they did and, you know, roll the dice again and see. And how would you and say? And I think if they brought in a, an outside GM, I could have seen more changes. But I think Conroy knows these players, knows this team, knew what had to happen. Yeah, and realistically this season say it's a, a carbon copy repeat of last year well then you let go of all the free agents to be you you know and start looking at like actually rebuilding and retooling in a more serious way look at like next off season of replacing those guys with different people because you'll have cap space and you know go through that kind of decision at that point but you know, this team also could be a 108, 110 point team again because, you know, the pendulum could swing all the way back the other way and this team could be gangbusters again and win the division because we saw that with Vegas. Like, they were really good, then they missed the playoffs, and then they won the Stanley Cup. This team could do a similar, you know, because we're basically the same built team as Vegas. We could do the same thing. The pendulum could go the other way. You don't let's know. Talk about, let's you talk don't, about that when we look ahead to the season. Yeah, it's just one of those where you don't know at this point where that pendulum is going, so it's hard to make long-term decisions. On paper, you don't need to make a lot of changes. No, and things will sort themselves out by themselves, uh, just as the season goes on. And like the team, like if they are trending badly, it you know the decision makes itself you start a retool if they're awesome you look at keeping the as many key guys as possible and moving on from whomever's left over and you know the flames need a new coach they did that i think they did a good job with that yeah. they i didn't expect the gm to leave but he did they did that like i think if you look at the moves they made, there might not have been new players coming in, but the team changed its identity quite a bit. And I think that you also can't have too much change in one summer. No. So I think, you know, with a new coach, with a new GM, I think this team got the business done that needed to be done. No, and like you look at last offseason, the amount of change was monumental. Um, going from Gaudreau Kachuk to Huberto Kadri was a monumental change. And... Like, it makes sense that the team struggled and then the coaching staff, you know, poured gasoline and set on fire. Um, <laughs> so, it, you know, having a stable off season after such a drastic change helps as well. And, like, the next generation of guys, the Manjapanis, the Andersons, the Shillingtons, are ready to assert themselves as being the core guys moving forward. And you know, the, those guys need some runway too to establish themselves as the future leaders of this team. And, you know, like it, it things are, you know, cause like, how would you say those guys were all playing second fiddle to the guys like Gaudreau and Kachuk. Now they're being called on to being more. So, you know, it'll be interesting to see how this all plays out as the season goes along. And the last piece of news before we close here that I want to bring everyone's attention to is uh, the f the announcement that the Flames will be making another number, um, I guess, joining Jerome from the new era of Flames veterans in the ra in the rafters. We have number nine and number thirty retired. Number twelve got retired recently, and this year, 
Number 34, Mika Kiprasov's jersey will be retired to the Saddle Dome Rafters on March 2nd this year. Um, I, I think it's great to see kind of that second coming of, you know, the Flames, not the 80s guys, but the guys that a lot of fans today know. And not many guys right now deserve more deserving for this organization than Kipper. They're going to have, what, four retirements and half of them are goalies. Yep. Well, and realistically, Kipper was that generation of Flames. Like, he... Yep. Was the best Without player on Kipper, the team. Without Kipper, they wouldn't have done as well as they did. No, from 03 till 2020 or 2012, 2013, like he was the best player on the team every game. And even with Jerome, like he was just, you know, he was the best goalie in franchise history. Um, didn't win a Stanley Cup, but dragged the team all the way to game seven by himself in a lot of ways. You know, like he stood on his head during the, the postseason in 04 um, when Detroit was locking things down in game five and six. Like he posted back-to-back shutouts to end the best team in the the Western conference. You know, like he fully deserving of every accolade he gets. And, you know, he should be in the hall of fame at some point as well. Um, Perhaps Finland's best ever goaltender. I'm really excited to hear what his uh, acceptance speech sounds like. He'll be there. <laughs> Jerome's <Maybe. laughs> was so good, but Jerome's always been a good talker. Like, you know, I can just see Kibber just stand up and be like, thank you, and walk away. Yeah. <laughs> walk away. It just stand there. Okay, raise it. That's okay, right. I'm good. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Like, you know, so it's 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 cool to see, and this is a guy fans have been talking about for a long time. Um, there's actually some news that came out today, I guess, He's a bit of a recluse, as people have known. He's in Finland. He doesn't take a lot of calls. The Flames are trying to get a hold of him. And it took Jamie McLennan reaching out saying, hey, the Flames are trying to get a hold of you. This is important. Take the call. And he was not taking their calls. So it took uh, Noodles, his former backup, reaching out to say, you want to take this call. So it's been hard to get him here. And I have to imagine that it's uh, it's going to be a lot of work to get him to Saldo. Make sure he's, he's available that night. Your mission, if you choose to accept it. <laughs> That's right. We'll probably send a whole team of guys to Finland and yeah. <laughs> you know make sure that he's make sure he's there, make sure he's got his speech ready. But I'm excited for this. I'm almost as excited as I was for Jerome. Um, I think with Conroy and Jerome at the helm of this team, I think we're going to see more of those guys from that era honored. And I know that Giordano's playing again this year, but I think he'll be probably the next number to go up there. Um, and I would not be surprised if this is the last number retired in the Saldome. Yeah, I agree. I'd be shocked if there's another one before uh, we're in the new building, whenever that so, will be. <laughs> and, and and I think there's something poetic about having your number retired in the building you played in. So I think that's awesome for Kipper, too. Yeah, it, exactly, because, you know, it was his house. So for Flames fans, save your pennies March 2nd. Tickets are probably going to be expensive for that one, but if you're going to one game this year, that's the game you want to be at. And I can tell you from going to Jerome's retirement, I was sitting in the press box for that one, the Flames do these retirement games really well. You'll walk out with swag. It's a great night. You'll have so much fun, and you you want to be there for that. Yeah. I know. I've already been asked for my tickets, and it's like, ah, no, no. Uh, no, <laughs> it was uh, it was funny sitting in the press box. It must have been really dusty because everyone I looked at, we all had, you know, water coming out of our eyes. It wasn't tears; it was the dust. That's what I was told. Yes. So it, um, it gets but it gets dirty in there sometimes. You it know. does. Nobody cleans that roof. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's a lot of fun. If you can be there, be there, and let's honor. You know, the sea of red's always loud. I want to challenge our fans right now before the season starts. Let's blow the roof off the dome for number 34. I think that'll be an easy goal to accomplish. I think so too. So between that, between the outdoor game, between whatever the Flames have scheduled uh, for the season and whoever makes a team, we will see you uh, shortly. We'll see you after the Young Stars tournaments. We'll be able to talk about what we've seen there, what we expect in uh, preseason, and our next show, we'll look ahead to the 2023-2024 NHL season. Yep. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.